millennium is a period of a renewed enlightenment. This talk about spirituality is an awakening to the spirit that all creation is sacred and that as human beings we are being called to communicate a profound life meaning towards the dynamic involvement of a culture of life and not of death and destruction. Indeed, we share a belief and a conviction that each person, regardless of race, class, caste, culture, religious, and political affiliation, has the inherent right to contribute based on his or her inner God-given gifts to obtaining total well-being and inner peace, joy, and happiness. Lying deep in the heart of every person is a dream of a world that will sustain our life support systems for the future of our children and generations to come. There are quite a number of organizations or networks that have been for several years doing compassionate action as they reach out to many poverty-stricken communities in Asia so that the less materially fortunate could enjoy the blessings of our planet Earth. They could not have reached out to many people and communities beyond their own limited world without the spirit of love that urges them to move in this noble direction. This topic of spirituality hopefully can lead us to a continued shared reflection of the deeper and profound meaning of our existence as well as the meaning of the works and projects of this network. This network is part of a bigger movement towards a heightening of our consciousness to our role in the building of a culture of life, peace and well-being, a radical commitment to recreating and transforming our world. For at least three centuries, our world has been advancing in material progress and in science and technology. It has brought about comfort to life. However, access to the benefits of this progress has been limited only to a few. In the context of this situation, a holistic view of reality has been and is being destroyed due to a materialistic and mechanistic worldview imbibed through Western civilization. This civilization evidently fragmented ourselves, fragmented families, communities, and societies, and has relegated to our collective unconscious our spiritual richness proclaimed by various religious persuasions. Dating back to 6th century BC, the exploration through a mystical tradition of the inner reality and its essence by ancient wisdom lovers in Asia has brought about an awareness of the divine spark in every human being and the integrity of creation in its varied forms. It seems that we are being invited and moved by the power of the same spirit to grow to higher consciousness towards recovering an age-old wisdom and what sages call the perennial philosophy. Through meditation, bio-spiritual exercises which are moving meditations and mindfulness in our daily life, we open ourselves to the ultimate reality which we grasp through an intuitive mystical faculty as the principle of unity in the universe and of all creation. This supreme being we may call by different names, Allah, El Shaddai, Yahweh, Buddha, Christ, Spirit, and God. This being we experience as transcendent and imminent, the ultimate other, giving us a new understanding of ourselves as part of the universe or the cosmos. And through receptiveness to the spirit, through a reflection, mindfulness, and meditation, we shall gain insights into the meaning of the physical, psychological, and social dimensions of our life. 
we are being called to become whole and to be holy, to heal all that we have fragmented and segmented in the past so that all life, despite diversity and differentiation, will be in solidarity and communion in and through God's Spirit, through whom we live and breathe and have our being. It has been conveyed to me that 30,000 people in a year of financial crisis in one country have committed suicide. It is as if people have forgotten the meaning of human existence. Asia, which is rooted from 6th century BC in spirituality and the consciousness of God in our hearts, has succumbed to the dominant materialistic and mechanistic worldview of Western civilization. While the West, through Christianity, welded with Greek-Roman civilization, had in the Middle Ages a God-centered or theocentric lifestyle, a shift in consciousness which was called the period of enlightenment in Europe in the 16th century led to a realization of the potentials of the human mind, evolved a rationalistic philosophy that undoubtedly spawned revolutions towards material progress. The scientific revolution, the industrial and technological revolution, the urbanization that followed, the beginning of formally rationally organized societies to replace natural communities have become prime movers not just of social change, but of a materialistic mindset that penetrated all areas of life. Accompanying these changes is media revolution. The culture through print, broadcast, and electronic media, and now with the advance of information and communication technology, is considered progress and development with a primarily materialistic basis. In fact, in this light, religion is thought to be an obstacle to the accepted values of individualism, of scientific attitude, of a mechanistic worldview, where each person is just part of a big machinery to perform and achieve in relation to money, wealth, and prestige. Values of material achievement unbridled competition, exploitation of Earth's resources, expansion of territorial boundaries for more political and economic power among and within countries have led to a situation of injustice, violation of human rights, mass poverty, a widening of the gap between the rich and the poor, all forms of social ills, war and violence, and degradation of the environment. The factory has become the symbol of social life. The factory which has killed the arts and crafts of communities is run with a division of labor where each worker for eight hours a day is involved with just one motion as he becomes integrated with an assembly line. It is in this kind of situation where both Karl Marx in his social analysis in 1847 and His Holiness Pope Leo XIII in a social letter to publics in 1891 had said that through industrialization, the person has become integrated with a machine where the person has gotten alienated from the product of his work. In the factory, the worker cannot see the product as an extension of his personality, unlike people who prior to the industrial age, working in small communities, are able to identify themselves with the total product they had created, whether this be a shoe, woven cloth, or any handicraft or piece of art. 
this division of labor in order to be efficient in mass production has been translated into social life. We have been educated to support the material civilization. People go to school merely to get a good job, to marry a person who can provide primarily material security or to advance in a career. Students, as it were, go from classroom to classroom like in an assembly line and at the end they are called products. The intangibles in life such as education towards socially oriented values and positive attitudes of cooperation, solidarity, compassion, healthy relationships, inner peace of mind have been relegated to the background. If religion is taught, it is almost like extracurricular activity. No wonder that despite so many universities in the world, and I can mention the case of my country, the Philippines, there are still almost half of the population who have become marginalized in society. In my country, small farmers, fisher folk, casualized workers, indigenous groups, those who guarantee that we have food on our table are themselves deprived of food security, health security, and benefits that only those who have been able to play the rules of this economic game of a highly monetized economy can enjoy. This materialistic philosophy of life, whose symbols are a drive for money and high technology, is the cause of so much suffering and deprivation of a great many people and the continual depletion of our natural resources promising a bleak future for generations to come. This materialistic philosophy has given a price to anything and even to persons. In this age, everything is valued for whatever cash it can bring. The lament of ordinary folks in our villages is, everything is now bought, everything has a price, Time is a cost. In communities where the economy was rooted in former times in relationships, in bartering value for value, now in a mediated economy where every exchange is mediated by money, ordinary folks, especially in the developing world, get lost in the discipline of the monetized economy. The mass production has led to mass education and to mass media. Whenever we speak of persons as belonging to a mass, one does not see the face and the uniqueness and the dignity of each person. In a materialistic environment, the person becomes merely a cost of production instead of being an expression of godliness, an expression of one made to the image of God and therefore is to be called to be more and more in the likeness of God, able to be creative, to use his or her inner giftedness for the good of many and the whole creation of which he or she is a part. The materialistic worldview measures the progress and the advancement of nations through gross national product, or GNP, that is the totality of all products and services in a country translatable to cash. A feminist economist, Hansel Henderson, has lamented the fact that works of aggression are valued more in monetary terms than works of cooperation. Thus, in some societies, the work of housewives especially are not valued. A housewife, although working almost 15 hours a day, will say she has no work, meaning she is not earning from her work. The lowest paid professionals in a society are those who are dealing with the essence of what life really means. The educators, the social workers, the nurses, most of these people are also females. 
The one half of our society is valued lower in monetary terms than the males. This is what is called the feminization of poverty. Especially in this time of economic globalization, it is difficult for economically poor countries to defeat a system where the so-called developed countries are way ahead in financial capital, knowledge, and technology. As the United Nations Development Program has said, total human development means that people live long, healthy, and creative lives. A Japanese film titled Dreams had communicated the profound message that to have a long life, two things are necessary, pure water, and pure air. And when someone dies after a long, healthy, and creative life, this must be celebrated. The way it is going, the more so-called development is spoken about, the more polluted become our air, land, and seas. No one in the Philippines prior to World War II would ever think that there would come a time when drinking water would be bought in bottles. Our land becomes less and less fertile. Our bodies contain more and more chemicals from the food we eat, which has been grown not organically, but with fertilizers made out of chemicals. Yes, the more commercialized development, the more polluted are our land, air, and water. We foresee that if industry and development tend to pollute the air, there will come a time when we too have to buy packaged oxygen. Yes, why has development led to more stress, more diseases, despite the advance in medical technology, more commercialized medicine? Through development, it is as if we are just hurrying to our death. Yes, as long as the paradigm of development is based on materialistic and mechanistic worldview, no matter what we do to help our fellow men who are being deprived, the problem of fragmentation, segmentation, alienation of people from their own selves, their families, their community, and their earth will neutralize whatever assistance we give to people. The fact that we are talking now about the need of spirituality is a new enlightenment that is calling us to anchor ourselves in the spiritual roots of Asia. Yes, it is greater Asia from ancient times that the receptivity to the divine spark in the human being and the conviction of a God transcendent and imminent first evolved. This tradition of opening up to the inner reality, which becomes a source of moral and ethical values, prior to concentrating on the outer reality as this was done in the West, is bringing us to the expansion of consciousness through the use of our intuitive mystical faculty. In these spiritual traditions, we have been taught to think in subtler realms. We have started to be aware that the vital life force in us and in creation has its source in an ultimate person revealed to us through holy men, women, prophets, and sages. In the Christian tradition, we believe that Jesus Christ is the full revelation of this ultimate reality incarnated in the world to show to us how to live and be in intimate union with God and His Spirit. In most religious traditions in Asia, we give emphasis to contemplation and meditation. We also practice moving meditations such as the Oriental Bio-Spiritual Exercises, Aikido in Japan, Yoga in India, and Tai Chi in China. The common principle taught in these exercises 
is that the way one breathes is the way to one's health, life, and being. In union with our Creator, we breathe God in and we breathe Him out in our lives. By breathing well with the thought that our body is the dwelling place of the Spirit, we become expressions of godliness in our life, expressions of God's compassion, God's love. A great Oriental poet, Cahil Gibran, says, God is not in our heart. We are in the heart of God. The attitude that takes us away from our false self, all of us are endowed with ego. But when we become egoistic, the ego becomes the center of our life. We fail to recognize our true self the God within us. We know that what we do is done in union with this God within us and outside us, a God imminent and transcendent. The infinite in our finite selves is the principle of our effectivity. It is a privilege to be aware that our existence is an overspill of God's love. And whatever we do, can be in turn a revelation of the love of God for each and every human person. The whole work of creation seems to pulsate with the beauty and the glory of our God of life and love. There is a beauty in us which is revealed through our sense of connectedness with all created reality. In this kind of spirituality of creation, where we come to have a body, mind, and spirit unity, we all the more realize that everything and every element of creation is sacred. We cannot make a person an object to be manipulated and exploited. Each one is a subject, an expression of the divine spark. Because all nature is sacred, we cannot desecrate the environment. This realization will lead us to convergence of efforts because we all are driven by the energy from God's heart. It is evident that we are being touched by the same wave that has touched some scientists in the world, Western as well as Eastern. There is an increasingly number of books that are being written independently, but converging in insights. Books that capture the hunger of people for what can heal the brokenness in humanity and the world. There is now an evolving worldview that makes people more and more realize that the essence of life is something invisible to the eye. More and more from various corners, not just from the churches and religious persuasions. People are beginning to discover the wholeness of life and all life forms. A holistic worldview is coming up and being discussed by a group of physicists, artists, economists, Christian contemplatives, theologians, and Buddhists. No less than a high energy physicist Fritz of Capra leads in talking to business managers of a new way of looking at reality that takes into consideration the subtler dimension of life. The series of discussions which were captured in Mystic Fire video way back in 1991 had as theme, Art and Science in a Changing Economy and Spirituality. West is looking east for a spirituality that will heighten the consciousness to the wholeness of reality and the interconnectedness of all elements of life. Critiquing its own civilization and identifying the wisdom that has been ours as Asians, Fritz of Capra, the physicist, suggests that all of us have to search for new ways of looking at reality from the perspective of a holistic worldview. He proposes a shift in our worldview from fragmentation to wholeness, 
from maximization to optimization, for laying emphasis on partnership rather than domination, on quality rather than just quantity, on sustainability rather than just growth. An economist, Clive Hamilton, trained in mathematics, history, and economics before becoming an academic economist, author, social critic, senior public servant, and international environmental advisor, published a book entitled The Mystic Economist. A chapter of his book talks about God, ecology, and economics. Hamilton has been described by John Stone as the new archpriest of the environmental movement. In the first chapter of the book, he writes, some people accuse the conservation movement of campaigning with quasi-religious fervor. But if religion means a return to the deepest spiritual and moral values, a reconnection between ourselves and our source in the natural world, is that not a cause for celebration? Are not the gravest ills of society and the gravest ills of ourselves due to the selfishness, the greed, the alienation, and the ingratitude that grow directly from the separation of our daily lives from our true natures? I am not suggesting that we replace science and economics with religion. I am arguing that we need to be chemists and alchemists, economists and moral philosophers, rational thinkers and humanist believers. In other words, we need to transcend duality and become whole. The mystic economist exposes the innermost core of modern economics and its influences on our life. The book argues that economics today, far from being the study of how to make us better off, reflects and promotes the very attitudes and behaviors that prevent us from living fulfilling and contented lives. And that unless we begin to struggle against both economic thinking that dominates the outer world and the economist within, we cannot turn from the path of economic suicide. It is also this mystic economist who laments the fact that people now are being brainwashed, especially through mass media, 